Welcome to the 81st Annual Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Symposium on Quantitative Biology. This year's topic is targeting cancer, and I'm Elizabeth McKenna, an associate editor at Cancer Discovery, and I'm sitting here today with Valerie Weaver, a professor and director of the Center for uh, Bioengineering and Tissue Regeneration at UCSF. Welcome, Valerie. Hi. Nice, <laughs> so, nice to be here. So this morning you spoke uh, at the symposium on the role of forces in cancer progression. Can you tell us a little bit more about the, the forces you mean? Yeah, I, I think um, the way that I am viewing cancer um, is that physically it's a, an alteration in the tissue uh, on multiple levels in terms of the mechanics. So on a gross level, um, you have an altered vasculature, you have a lot of fluid in the tissue, um, and that actually can create a kind of milieu where it's really hard to get drugs in, and that's what people have talked about. Um, but what, I, what we're looking at, and what people haven't really thought about for quite a while, is the tumor cells themselves, when they have an alteration in their, in their, in their genome, many of the oncogenes that are selected for change how the cells um, how the cells are, their contractility behavior is. So it changes both how squishy the cells are mm -hmm. and it changes how much the cells can pull on each other mm -hmm. and on the matrix around them. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition, and that changes how the cells respond to signals. Um, it, it determines the kind of um, soluble factors that they secrete. And we believe that this is in part what actually stimulates some of the um, uh, stromal cells, like the immune cells that come in and also the fibroblasts. And the fibroblasts themselves, they're super synthetic. And mm -hmm. so they actually pr create a lot of um, uh, matrix proteins that they lay down. And more and more of these matrix proteins, of course, create a denser environment that is a bit stiffer. Mm -hmm. And they have enzymes that they cross-link that matrix and they remodel it and they make it into these little tracks. Mm -hmm. And the immune cells come in and they get in on the action because a lot of these cytokines secrete and get all these immune cells coming in. And the immune cells, of course, they start secreting things like TGF-beta, which drives the fibroblasts to produce more proteins mm -hmm. that actually create this real, if you imagine, like a real thick, dense, kind of uh, stiff fibrotic tissue. And so that actually has repercussions all the way across the board in terms of the physical properties of the environment and how the tumor cells and the immune cells and the vasculature is being influenced by that stiffness. Mm -hmm. And then what people also don't think about is that as the tumor mass expands, um, you have what's called, so it's not expanding like a balloon into, into in infinite space, it's expanding into this really dense environment. And of course the dense environment pushes back because it's a kind of resistance force. Mm -hmm. So you have a solid stress, from the tumor cells as they expand. You have a reciprocal tension from the environment, uh, from the, this dense environment. You have a buildup of fluid. And so you have this massive solid stress in the, in the tumor as well. And so all of these conspire to create an environment that is really difficult to get drugs into, creates a hypoxic environment. Mm. But the thing that we're saying is that that fundamentally reprograms how that tumor cell behaves. Mm -hmm. And the key point, and I'll sort of wrap up here, is that <laughs> it's not homogeneous. It's not like one big ball of tumors. Mm -hmm. It's a very heterogeneous environment. And so you have little tiny niches and you have little railroad tracks where the cells migrate on these stiff tracks. So it's a really complicated and fascinating thing mm -hmm. to try to understand how these forces are another layer, yet another complexity to the tumor and how that changes the initiation, progression, and aggressiveness of those tumors. So you spoke today about uh, intrinsic and extrinsic forces. Uh, can you maybe elaborate a little bit about that and what are the difference between the two types of forces? So every cell in your body, of course, has a, even if they're not a muscle cell, they have amateur, they have myosins. So they're capable of pulling on and they have contractility. And um, that's kind of, that's your intrinsic tension, if you will. But you know, so force is actually um, force over area. It's an active, you know, it's an active process. So. Um, so it's like a, the cells will pull on, they're always kind of parsing the environment around them. They'll either pull on each other or they'll pull on the matrix. That's intrinsic tension. Mm -hmm. And in a tumor, what happens if you just, or in a normal cell, if you put them in a stiff environment, they tune their tension to the best, you know, through, the, through their capacity to the stiffness of the environment around them or to the tension of the other cells that they're interacting with. What happens in a tumor is that, of course, we know that there's genetic modifications. And what we're finding that's really interesting is many of the same genetic pathways that are selected for in cancer are the ones that are changing intrinsic tension. So that's that end of it. 
Um, and of course, if you have a big mass of cells and it's pushing out, that's kind of an intrinsic force. Mm -hmm. Where we're thinking about extrinsic force is like the stiffness of the environment. Mm -hmm. We're talking about if the, you know, uh, basically shear, shear forces when the cells are in the vasculature, that's an external force. Mm -hmm. Stretching, um, interstitial pressure, all those are actually external types of forces. And they cross length scales. And ultimately, there's a, a sort of gross length scale that affects how the cell and the tissue behaves, but really when the cell cares about is what's happening around it. Mm -hmm. Just like you and I care about the fact that we're sitting on these chairs that I'm perched on and I don't want to fall over. <laughs> um, so the, the tumor cell actually is, um, really cares about what's going on right around it. And that right. determines how it signals mm -hmm. and how it behaves um, you know, given the various different soluble factors mm -hmm. that it's experiencing. And how do the tumor cells sense the force? And how do they, how do they, uh, what molecules are involved in sensing? And then how do they propagate the signal to affect yes. changes in the phenotype? So, um, I mean, I think of it as two sides of the same coin. So, um, a mechano, so it's not, it's not as though that you have specialized mechanotransducers, mm -hmm. although, you know, in some instances you do. So ion channels, for example, are, you know, quintessential, they've been known for decades as being sensitive to mechanical cues. Hearing is basically your, 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 your basically the cilia, the, the hearing in, uh, is in mediated through ion channels because they're sensitive to the uh, basically um, uh, change in the, um, in the in, in, induced by sound waves and it actually opens up and regulates the ion channel. So that's one way to sense mechanical cues. Cilia, primary cilia, will, is are a kind of quintessential mechanical mm -hmm. uh, sensors. Um, but also integrins, they're pretty classic mechanotransducers, mm -hmm. but virtually any transmembrane receptor of any sort that actually can respond to a delta change mm -hmm. in sort of mechanics or force is essentially a mechano receptor. And then what it has to do, so you have to have something that changes its behavior. So whether it's like opening up of a cryptic site, enhancing the timing and the opening of the ion channel um, to allow in ions or closing the ion channel or any of these things will actually function as a mechano sensor. And then something has to be able to amplify that response. Mm -hmm. So an integrin is, you know, it's 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 a it's a it's, it responds to the mechanic the mechanics of the environment. It also responds to different ECM proteins. So mm -hmm. it's a biochemical signal. So biochemistry and biomechanics are the same thing. They're mm -hmm. the same. They're different sides of the same coin. So then you actually just amplify the signal, and that signal is amplified, and then eventually doesn't do anything unless it actually can affect a change, mm -hmm. either by changing actin, you know, polymerization, by changing. Um, uh, basically, high, it changes higher order chromatin structure, so it changes the NAT signal, or it mm -hmm. can just amplify the signal. Mm -hmm. So all of those things will eventually affect how the cell responds. Now, so. do tumor cells react to forces and interact with their extracellular matrix in all the same way, or does it depend on their genetic background? I think it depends on their, you know, so this is really interesting. So it's something that we're just starting to scratch the surface of. Um, so, it, I, I, I would, what we're looking for, a lot of people are looking for in the sort of engineering and the sort of biophysics field is are there certain principles that we can be guided on um, to think about how tissue mechanics can be layered on top of everything that we know about how tumors develop and behave. Um, having said that, I, I believe if you think about a, like a glioblastoma, versus a pancreatic cell, versus mm -hmm. uh, a bone, osteo, you know, so mm -hmm. any of these cells, they all, they actually fundamentally have different mechanical behaviors to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, and so the kind of mechanical cues and how they're gonna change the cell's behavior is probably gonna be slightly different. Mm -hmm. And the kind of pathways that be affected would be slightly different mm -hmm. because they're different to begin with. Mm -hmm. But there may be similar principles that working across. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if I answered that correctly, but. Um, certainly, um, our data with the pancreas suggests that if you have a more basal um, genotype in the tumor, that you have a much more um, contractile phenotype mm -hmm. and that you have a very um, enhanced mechano behavior, mm -hmm. very unique mechanical signature. And we have some new data on glioblastomas mm -hmm. that if you have an IDH mutation, which is known to create a much lower grade or less aggressive tumor, that that sort of curbs or curtails your mechano phenotype, which mm -hmm. is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so that those are two independent things that said that it's different. And triple negative breast cancers versus luminal breast cancers, fundamentally different mechanics. Mm. So um, it may be a continuum, different molecules uh, that are affecting things differently, but ultimately 
higher or lower stiffness affecting how the tumor mm -hmm. behaves. Now, since the title of the symposium is targeting cancer, uh, do you have any ideas yeah. on on uh, ways that you know we could design drugs that could target certain pathways that are involved in mechanotransduction, or or should we be thinking about targeting the stroma and affecting the the components yeah. of the extracellular matrix? So I've been asked this a dozen times in many different ways, <laughs> and this makes it thirteen. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean it's a, it's a, it's an excellent question. So. You know, a naive perspective would be say, oh, well, we're just going to go in and inhibit, you know, mechanics. The mm -hmm. problem is um, rock inhibitors were, you know, contraindicated for treatment of brain tumors because they cause a massive drop in blood pressure. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, if you just completely ablate the, the, the stroma, certainly if the tumor cells are really contractile to begin with, they won't care. That mm -hmm. could be explaining some of the reason there's been some problems. Plus, the stroma has good things that it does, mm -hmm. not just bad things. Mm -hmm. So the way we're looking at it is in a kind of three or four different approaches. One, can we exploit aspects of the mechanics and the things that we know about mechanics to enhance um, uh, patient stratification, identify those patients, for example, that have a very unique mechanical signature, mm -hmm. and those maybe would be contraindicated for some of the stromal ablation therapies. Mm -hmm. um, or those individuals might have a higher propensity to metastasize, so those individuals would be treated differently. That's how we're thinking about it for pancreatic cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, we're also uh, doing some studies with other people where we're looking at lipophilic statins, which have, um, you know, effects on adrenal adrenalation and they affect, um, they calm down the tension in the tumor. And those individuals that are on these lipophilic statins actually have a, a lower, um, a, a lower incidence or at least less aggressive pancreatic cancers. They have a longer, you know, mm -hmm. um, expected survival. So mm -hmm. that's interesting. So those are ways to think about it. Um, there was, we had started, we've developed a mass spec methods to look at the profile of crosslinks in the matrix. And those would then tell us which enzymes are changing the crosslinking and are those unique in tumors that we can pick those. Now, mm -hmm. lysooxidase is one, but it's not good for pancreas because, because it has, um, you know, anti, anti RAS effects, the, the propeptide. But it could work for other kinds of tumors, mm -hmm. but not for a RAS dependent tumor. Um, there's prolyl hydroxylases, which are also out there. So that's another way to think about it. Uh, I know Sunil Himigarani is doing these hyaluronidase, you know, hyaluronidase treatment. Um, so we're interested to look at that. So um, then you can imagine trying to go into the cell and come up with some kind of Achilles heel. Could we figure out a way that it would be useful for, um, you know, uh, what do they call it? I guess, what do they call it? Synthetic lethal or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. <laughs> the other thing that we're thinking about is can we use it to actually empower the immune function? So that's another thing that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to go at it in a lot of different ways and we have to work with our colleagues that are doing fantastic work in the whole immune manipulation. Mm -hmm. um, we're also doing some really cool studies with um, looking at uh, how mechanics regulates at the nano level, um, how uh, RAS signaling occurs and mm -hmm. how RTK signaling is processing the cell. And that is turning up some really interesting key targets that we could use there mm -hmm. because it turns out that the whole dynamics of basically RAS signaling and, and effector recruitment mm -hmm. and, and turnover is exquisitely sensitive to the mechanical cues in the environment. So that actually, you know, the, I call it the devil's in the details, right? <laughs> we need to go after this in a lot of different ways. A really simplistic perspective is mm -hmm. not going to work. Right. I would, I would say that's, that's what's got us into these problems in the first place. Right. So um, I'd rather use a, you know, a scalpel than a hatchet, you know? Right. There'll probably be lots of context specificity yeah, and yeah. You, maybe different combination of strategies will be needed. Yeah. So. I do know that there's, there are, you know, colleagues of mine in the mechanics area because this has now become, you know, hotter. I mean, when I first started doing this, they thought I was a flake. <laughs> um, and now I'm actually pleased to say that, you know, maybe not in the mainstream uh, cancer rate field, but certainly, you know, in the engineering and biophysics, they're all going, cr you know, crazy mad on this stuff. Uh, but they think that it's going to be, you know, one size fits all and it's going to be super simple and mm -hmm. I, I coming along and of course they don't want to hear this, but I think, no, 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 <laughs> it's not like that. It's actually more elegant and more interesting. Right, right. So, and I think figuring that out means I'm going to have a job for quite a while. <laughs> well, I think with that, I think it's all we have time for, but I'd like to thank you so much for uh, joining us and I, I hope you enjoy the rest of the yeah, symposium. It's, been, it's a great symposium <laughs> and thank you very much for the interview and for your great questions. Well, thank you. Thanks. Thank you.